Hi guys and welcome to my first ever session of Run the Gauntlet, uh, which is really exciting. Uh, this program is all about writers sending in the opening scenes of their current works in progress and I apply a developmental assessment of those scenes in real time uh, and then those writers really generously agree to share their work with the writing community and also the insights that we garner from their work so that all of the devices and techniques and ideas that are explored can be um, shared across across the community as opposed to um, only benefiting one project. It's also an opportunity for people to learn a little bit more about what developmental editing entails. Um, Obviously, it's very different to copy editing and proofreading. It's all about uh, improving the creative strategy of a story rather than the, the grammar and syntax. So hopefully uh, today we can uh, all learn a little something new, um, bounce ideas and exchange ideas. And um, first and foremost, I want to thank the writer for, for sharing his work with us today and, and taking part in this process. He's a great guy. I've worked with him before. Um, this, to, to give you guys a little bit of background. Uh, this is the first draft of a manuscript. Um, it's a new genre for the writer. It's uh, a, a comedy sci-fi that's a kind of tribute to the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So, so we're looking at a kind of absurdist uh, piece of, of humor uh, as opposed to a kind of, you know, serious sci-fi with uh, high drama, high stakes. I'm sure we'll have all of those things too, but, um, you know, a, a comedic exploration is a very different kind of story. Um, and I've got a, an excerpt here from the writer. Uh, so these are, see, these are some of the issues that he would like to see addressed. Um, I worry that my MC isn't likable or that his reactions to this situation, uh, to his situation might be too stupid. And generally, I worry about an incongruity between what I see in my head and what a reader gleans from the actual words on paper. Specifically, am I painting a clear picture of what is happening? So that's obviously, this is a writer who's written several books now. Uh, and even with that amount of experience under his belt, uh, those are the kinds of issues that that he worries about. They're obviously the the issues that all writers worry about, I think, to a degree. Um, so so very common uh, points there, and we'll certainly address those points uh, in this live edit. So without further ado, I'm going to um, jump straight over to the manuscript, and uh, we will go through the various points that I have. I'm going to read the story aloud to you guys and I'm going to pause every now and then to uh, explain a comment that I've made so that you can um, experience the edit uh, real time as I go from one point to the next. Uh, I should also pause to say I hope that you like my uh, sci-fi <laughs> inspired attire today. Um, I thought that it was very appropriate and I don't get many opportunities to wear this jacket, hence its appearance. So let's get started with the first ever Run the Gauntlet. Um, Whiskey Tango Hotel, Chapter 1. As it turns out, cow tipping isn't a real thing. But how was I supposed to know? I'm a city boy and I was trashed. Even if I'd known you can't really tip over a sleeping cow, I'd have still gone with them. No way I was going to punk out now, not after all the hell I'd been through. You can see that I've just suggested deleting the word now there um, just to keep the tenses a little more consistent. We're narrating in um, past tense, so uh, suddenly jumping to present tense uh, is slightly inconsistent in that um, we think that the, the character is relating to us something that's already happened and then suddenly we're uh, back in a timeline as if it's about to happen. Those are, that's a minor thing, but these little things at the start of a story uh, can, we want to avoid any opportunity for a reader to feel confused or for there to be a slight distraction or jarring factor. Um, I usually don't worry about things like that. Uh, at, at this stage of developmental editing because the draft has, still has so much work to go through, but uh, I figure for the sake of being thorough, I might, I, I'll, I'll raise that point now. Uh, it was rush week and I'd already survived three grueling days of hazing. There had been 40 potential Rho Omicron Omicron 
initiates at the start and it was now down to 20. We'd been split into groups of five plus two standing members. I don't know what the other groups were doing, but my group went camping. All right, boys, load them up, commanded Evan. We's going cow tipping. Yeehaw! Nobody whipped out a phone to Snopes cow tipping. We all just piled into the Jeep, with piled being the key word. Evan and the other standing member, John, took the front, leaving the, only the tiny back row for the five initiatives. Since two of my potential brothers could walk, let alone race to the Jeep, could barely walk, let alone race to the Jeep, I managed to score a bench seat. Thank God, because John flew down the dirt road, bouncing helter-skelter. As we left the hills, a windy, a windy road straightened and John killed the headlights without slowing. We bowed on through the black of the moonless night. So we have a very interesting premise here. We have these guys going out um, on a cow tipping adventure. Our character is obviously trying to make his way into a fraternity um, and they're you know, driving around on this moonless night uh, about to go on an adventure. I think that's a that's a solid opening premise. Uh, you know, lots of different things could go wrong. Uh, you know, it's an interesting setting. It's an interesting activity. So, you know, it's a fun, engaging scene for us to begin the story with. What I would say in all of this, though, is that we're taking in a lot of information about the fraternity, the number of boys that have gone, who who is a leader and who is a follower, uh, where they're all going. And really, um, as it, regardless of whether we're working on a, a book of sci-fi or romance or action or, um, you know, historical fiction, whatever, really one of the uh, number one priorities that we have uh, in any opening scene is to connect the reader with the character, to present the character as someone who is compelling, who is uh, potentially someone we can relate to or empathize with. So even if the main character is a really grouchy anti-hero with a drinking problem, we're still going to look for small vulnerabilities in that persona and his personality and his life in the problems that he's dealing with that will allow a reader to uh, relate to him on some level and empathize with him on some level. Um, if we have a uh, hero in a romance novel, a, a single mother with three kids, well, we're going to show the tough parts of her life, um, but also how strong and admirable she is as a person, because again, we're wanting to develop that connection between the character and the reader. Uh, now, we're only one page into this novel, and that's not a lot of time to connect uh, a character to the reader, but the point that I would make is that so far, a lot of our focus has been on the external, what they're doing and why they're there, building content, context. And that's really, that's a very natural default uh, reaction to uh, want to set up the story as clearly as and succinctly as possible. But uh, what can happen in the process is that we lose touch with what's really important, which is the character. Why is this someone we should care about? What are his redeeming features? What are his strengths? What are the weaknesses that are going to cause trouble down the line in this story? Uh, you know, maybe the uh, character is too gullible, too trusting. Maybe the character uh, has a tendency to ma make rash, impulsive decisions before thinking them through. Maybe the character is really down on himself. You know, he thinks that he never gets anything right. He had a really critical parent uh, and that, you know, paralyzes him sometimes. Uh, you know, that lack of self-confidence can be a real problem when it comes time for him to rise up and, and face his challenges. Uh, whatever those uh, internal elements are, they're all ways to make a reader, uh, you know, recognize those own things in themselves and kind of go, oh, this is someone that I could care about. This is someone that I understand. This is someone with motivations that I can relate to or problems that I can relate to or dreams and hopes and aspirations that I can relate to. So we need to form that bond between a character and reader because without that that connection, the the reader doesn't have a deep emotional investment in what's happening. We only want to find out what happens next if we care about the person that it's happening to. We could have an incredible tsunami uh, on the horizon 
Um, and that will be very dramatic and full of uh, lots of action. But we're going to care a lot more about that impending tsunami if we've had a few chapters uh, to to bond us to the young family of uh, the fishermen's children that live right on the shore who are who are going to you know face this in terrible uh, incoming problem. So. Um, in this opening scene, I think we have a great premise, but I'm not seeing a lot of the character's personality come through uh, or the, the personality traits or archetypal traits that would make me um, emotionally invest in him and, and therefore be more invested in finding out what's about to happen to him. And to give you a bit of an example, you know, even in the first page, but particularly in the first three pages, I would want to be able to tell if this character is, you know, potentially a bit of a nerd. And uh, maybe with these tough boys who are all part of this fraternity, he's really trying to prove himself. He feels like a bit of a loser and, um, you know, out of his league and he's maybe trying a little too hard to fit in. Um, or alternatively, you know, we could have a character who is uh, a real jock, a real hero, um, you know, the All-American, he's he's definitely in this fraternity. It's, you know, doing these activities is, is almost like a token uh, thing because he's the, the golden-haired, perfect guy. Um, but deep down, he's harboring some uh, insecurities uh, that potentially he's not as great as everyone thinks or, or he has a, d a deep and dark, shameful secret of some sort that he doesn't want anyone to find out. Um, you know, Another thing, uh, another example could be that, and, and this could work well in a comedy uh, scenario, is that this character is, um, you know, uh, a, a real funny guy, really, really full of humor, um, but that is masking a uh, deeper sense of um, isolation or loneliness, uh, some other negative element that will play a role in the story that unfolds. Uh, so, so you can see there are a lot of different archetypes there that I've just plucked out of thin air and kind of tossed up as examples. Um, and depending on where the story goes from here, they could be completely wrong or, or close to something that's right. But the, the perfect jock who um, everyone thinks is fantastic but is harboring a secret you can see instantly how we're going to empathize with a character like that on some level. Uh, he's going to feel more human to us, more vulnerable to us, and we're going to be interested in finding out what happens to him next. Likewise, if he's the nerd who's the smartest guy in the room but is always overlooked uh, because he doesn't have the biggest muscles or the best hair or whatever, we're going to empathize with that character. And we're going to want to see what happens to him next. And this whole premise of being with these boys, um, being going cow tipping, trying to prove yourself to get into a fraternity, um, you know, those personality types and archetypes suddenly shift the context of that scene altogether. If he's the golden boy who everyone thinks is great, um, you know, then he's in a very different position to the nerd who's desperately trying to prove himself. So this is where, you know, we have a strong plot foundation, but we want to bring in more of the character development. And of course, some characters, um, particularly Arthur Dent in uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, um, they are unassuming. They're kind of everyday figures. They don't need to be made into big caricatures of the Joker or, or the warrior or the king or, or whatever archetype you want to talk about. But even so, uh, we need to find important ways to humanize them and ensure that their internal state, their goals, their dreams, their wishes are coming through clearly in the story. Otherwise, they become a kind of passive ob observer who's just walking around taking everything in. And that does, if, if that's the case, there's less there for a, a reader to connect with. Uh, we barreled through the black of the moonless night, then slid to a stop. All right, fellas, this is it, announced John, killing the engine. From here on, no talking. Down a ravine, we stumbled, through some trees, over a fence, and into a field we went. Over that way, whispered Evan, pointing. John strained to see. I doubt he saw anything, but we all heard a deep groan, one that could have only come from a large animal. I'll pause here just to say John strained to see. Um because we're in the point of view of our main character, it's uh, if we wanted to show that John was straining to see something, we would have to show that from the perspective of what that would look like from the external. So um, 
John might have pushed past them. Uh, his eyes squinted in the dark. Then we're you know, showing from the main character's perspective that he can see that John is straining to see. If we just have John strain to see, it's almost like we've suddenly jumped inside John's head to to, to experience his experience, um, which is challenging with point of view because we've already established that we're in the point of view of the main character. So we need to see what the main character is seeing um, as opposed to jumping inside the head of other characters and, and risking head hopping. This is so awesome, whispered Kevin. Shut up, pleb, hissed Evan. Um, really minor point, but Kevin and Evan, I, even though visually the words, uh, the names are spelled in a very different way, um, they, they're a little Conf they're a little too similar and in my mind they start to get tangled so I you know it's not to say that you have to have really different names for each of your characters but I think uh, some it, it, it just makes sense to, to call one Tom and one Billy um, because there's no risk there of us confusing them. Uh, I elbowed Kevin for emphasis. I'd only known him a few days, but I really wanted him to make the cut. Kev was a great big fat kid, always grinning about something, always cracking jokes. I really liked him. Um, now, we're told that there are 20 potential recruits for the fraternity in the earlier scene. They've been split into groups of five. Um, and we know that I believe it's uh, John and Evan who are leading the group. Uh, so there are five other boys in this scene. Um, Pers I, I don't believe that we see the other guys in this scene or there are some guys missing that we don't really refer to. Um, and I always find that it's best to avoid having opening scenes with lots of characters because the reader is already having to absorb all of this new information, this context and setting and, and get to know the, the, you know, understand the plot premise and, and connect with the characters. And if we've tossed five, you know, side characters in there, it's uh, you, you're really increasing your burden as a writer uh, to introduce each of those characters with a sense of distinction and discernment to make them memorable, uh, to keep them from kind of blending together, to make sure that every single one of them has an important role to play in the story. They're not just kind of there for the sake of it to bulk up numbers. Um, so my feeling is uh, that I haven't read the rest of this manuscript potentially all of these characters have really important roles to play and it's important for every single one of them to be introduced in this scene. Um, if that's the case, then it's important to think of ways to introduce each character so that they are truly memorable, so that we remember that Kevin is the the nice um, overweight kid or that um, John is the kind of tough leader uh, who who has a bit of an anger issue. But, you know, again, keeping in mind that character development, how it keeps every single one of the characters distinct, how it introduces the potential for the kinds of problems or troubles that they're going to have later in the story that are going to impact the plot and how we can foreshadow that in the way that we introduce them now. So, you know, maybe... Um, these boys have been uh, camping actually for a couple of days and we have an opening scene where they walk into the campsite and all the food's gone. Everyone instantly blames Kevin who gets really upset um, and later our character finds the wrappers in John's tent, for example, and he's supposedly their leader but he's eaten all of their food and shifted the blame onto someone else. So straight away... You know, we still have the premise of them going cow tipping and everything, but we've introduced some action um, and scene elements that immediately cement in our minds that John might position himself as a leader, but he's not really trustworthy and that Kevin really does have a very good heart and is someone to potentially be uh, protected or an, or an ally for our, for our character as the story goes on. You can see how we're introducing each character in a memorable way so that we're not just taking in a dozen names in the opening scene and trying to keep 
um, you know, a, account of who is who and, and their different personalities and contexts and backstories and relationships to the character. And, you know, it can, it can quickly become uh, overwhelming. And if the characters are interchangeable, then when one of them gets killed in chapter two or one of them betrays our uh, character in chapter three, we haven't really done the setup to to allow that turning point and that action to carry a full sense of gravity and weight. So all of these little uh, character development elements go a long way to making sure that the plot points when they come uh, are as dramatic and affecting as possible. Uh, as we continue on, uh, lead the way, Tubby, said John, giving Kev a shove from the behind. We crept toward the noise uh, in the same direction Evan had pointed. Soon we could hear the heavy breathing of large animals, occasionally blowing gusts from their noses. Before long, we could see large shadowy figures. Really minor point, but I always tried to avoid uh, repeating words in this instance, large, uh, from one sentence to the next. Of, of course, it's not something to worry about at this level of, uh, at this point in the draft. It's something to think about in an advanced draft stage, but for the sake of being thorough, I think it's worth mentioning. Uh, it was scary, really. I mean, they were everywhere, at least 20 of them. Do cows bite? Oh, man, I stepped in something, yelled somebody. This was followed by a chorus of shushing and laughter. And a moo, several moos. Three or four cows had been awakened and one shied away from us, waking the others. John squatted down, so we all followed suit. It took a while, but eventually the racket began to settle. And then a light came on, a porch light up a hill, maybe 200 yards from us, and a light inside the house. The front door opened and an old man in his underwear stepped onto the porch holding a shotgun. He's got a gun, somebody screamed. Uh, quick note here, but I think in general, it's best to avoid uh, redundancies. So in this line, for example, I would uh, have the description of a man uh, walking out, say, with a long, uh, dark object in his hands. Um, and then in this line, I would have, he's got a gun. So that there's a kind of setup and then a revelation. Uh, as opposed to just repeating the same piece of information twice. Uh, I was already running. We all were running, stumbling, pushing, shoving. Boom. Didn't matter that the old man had shot straight up in the into the air. I couldn't see. Well, uh, I'll pause here to say, again, this is a kind of POV issue. If if our character can't see that the old man has shot straight up into the air, um, then there's no way for him to know that he has. He could have shot at the boys but but missed them uh, or, or shot too far for them to see the, uh, you know, bullets hitting uh, trees or, or soil or whatever. So um, it's, it's a minor thing, but uh, it's important to either say the character assumes that he shot straight up into the air um, or, or acknowledge the fact that uh, it's a possibility, but it's not something that he can confirm. Otherwise, he becomes omniscient and all-knowing, which is which which is contradictory with third person limited. Um, I imagined he'd been aiming right at me. So that's where it, it feels consistent again because our character is imagining something without being able to directly confirm it. My running went into warp drive. I was first to the Jeep. Everyone piled on. Everybody piled on. The engine turned and we were moving. Wait for me, guys, guys, guys. The Jeep kept going. Dude, stop. We can't leave him, I yelled, pushing my head between bodies to see out the back. Uh, so this is always a good uh, point. Uh, whenever we're introducing a main character to the reader, it can be very effective to have a save the cat moment where we see our character do something selfless in this instance, telling the other boys to wait to pick up Kev because that then uh, indicates to the reader that the character is a good person who is worthy of our emotional investment. Even if they have some pretty big flaws, um, there are some reasons there to um, like them as well. And it's called the save the cat technique because if you show a character going to all this trouble to save the cat at the start of a story, uh, then uh, as I said, you're going to feel more inclined to think that they're worthy of your liking them and, and following them on their adventure and their journey to come. Uh, personally, I think that uh, you can make a bigger save the cat moment than than in this moment. It's real. It's quite fleeting. It's there and then it's gone. Um, I would possibly look at a bigger action of some sort. 
uh, but the technique itself is is definitely effective. John slowed up but didn't stop. Kevin was huffing and puffing, reaching for my hand. Finally, he caught it. I tugged and he leaped onto the back bumper. John tore off with Kev clinging for dear life to the spare tire on the back. And then the light, so bright that it was blinding from above. The Jeep slid to a stop, jostling off the road and into a field. Now, I have a uh, comment here, which is just um, that this is the moment where the alien abduction begins. Uh, and so we go from these boys uh, tearing off down the road, uh, one of them holding on to a spare tire, and then the light so bright it was blinding from above. My point here is that uh, mentally, we think that they're being chased by the farmer at this point. That's the main threat that we've established. There's a gun, etc. Um, so when I read this, it almost feels like uh, the the farmer is coming after them in a car with a in a truck with a big uh, set of spotlights, or uh, you know, there's a police helicopter overhead. But it, it kind of pops up out of nowhere. The last thing that you know I'm thinking when I read this is it's you know, an alien abduction. I think that whenever we have a major turning point in a story like this, uh, where the tables suddenly turn, we want to build up to that moment a little bit more so that it carries with it the full weight that it should carry, the full sense of significance. If it's kind of popped up out of nowhere and it's just another detail in an already detail-filled action-packed sequence, we can almost kind of miss it and not really grab at how important it is. So uh, in, in this example, I would be looking at how, you know, maybe the boys get far away enough that they breathe a sigh of relief, like we kind of did it. They're laughing. Um, everything's great. And then there's, a, you know, a bright light from above. So we, we create a little bit of a pause to say, this is not the farmer. This is something new. Um, and then when that bright light appears, uh, maybe we have the character um, think, oh, my God, the, you know, farmer call like uh, police or is this a helicopter what the hell and then suddenly you know he notices that all of his friends around him have frozen uh and and the jeep is starting to slide off the side of the road and we know that something's seriously wrong like the police can't do this um this is something supernatural this is something um you know, greater than the scope of, you know, what could be considered normal on planet Earth. So, but we, instead of kind of tossing it in there too quickly and too abruptly, we add detail and description that starts to uh, signify to the reader something is seriously wrong here and it's getting weirder and weirder with every additional detail that we give you so that when the, um, you know, final... Uh, reveal comes that they've been abducted by aliens, uh, it feels consistent with the level of kind of anticipation or um, confusion that we've kind of developed over that time as opposed to it kind of just popping up like a, a, a jack in the box. So I'll read the whole sequence to you and, and see if you think uh, that we could afford to uh, allude to this uh, massive turning point with a little bit more space and a bit more gravity. John tore off with Kev clinging for dear life to the spare tire on the back and then the light so bright that it was blinding from above. The jeep slid to a stop jostling off the road and into a field. Everybody was frozen except me like really frozen. I pushed and shoved trying to get out. Whoosh the light was suddenly gone. Pushing between, I managed to stand on the seat. We weren't on a dirt road anymore. We were in a dimly lit room. I looked around, a huge room, mostly empty except for shelving and stacked crates. My friends, they were still frozen, like really frozen. Slightly repetitive of the line we had earlier. Uh, not frozen, frozen as in ice, but time. I climbed down and shook Kev. Hey, man. Hey, wake up, dude. I waved a hand in front of his eyes. No response. His eyes stayed wide open, staring up at something terrifying. I love the uh, tension of that. That's a great line. He looked like he was in the middle of screaming. I looked around. I was, I was in some sort of cargo bay. Holy crap. I've seen this movie before. We've been kidnapped by aliens. Before I could wrap my mind around that, a noise came from behind, a door sliding open. So 
I, I, th I love the comedic elements of this scene, um, but I guess it's always a balance. It's about uh, highlighting the comedy and how ridiculous all of this is, but also revealing each uh, new turning point with as much gravity as possible. So, uh, you know, I, I would love to see the, the intrigue and awe build a little bit longer, um, you know, to, to show versus tell. How does he know he's in a cargo bay? Uh, you know, that, that is alien. Are there alien symbols on the walls? Um, technologies that he doesn't understand? Maybe something that he touches that zaps him? Um, but as he puts the pieces together, the reader's sense of tension and anticipation has been, been given room to develop. Uh, if we give them all of the answers too quickly, it's like we're delivering the blow before they've had a chance to start fearing it. And we really want um, them to be on the edge of their seat before the answer comes. So we want to allude to uh, a lot of these elements um, before, you know, we we deliver that, that shocking truth. Um, and I think that this sequence has been uh, written effectively, but to me, it's it's a lot to take in in a very short time. And coming straight off the the run from the farmer, uh, it's a little tangled. So I think that there's room there to um, structure and and reveal the turning point with a little bit more space and a bit more gravity. The other thing I would say is that we've taken in so much in this scene, like a lot of stuff has happened. Um, and, and my feeling here is that we could actually do with a scene break. Uh, you know, we've, especially if we added more character development to these opening scenes and, and to the, you know, point that we're at now, so that we had a better idea of who our character is, his motivations, his personality traits. Um, once we do that, the scene is naturally going to be longer and a bit more detailed probably. Uh, and and at this point, I think that's a great opportunity to give the, the reader a bit of breathing space um, and and create a bit of a hook to, to end one scene where something really major has happened. They've been abducted but also to open the next scene with a big question, what's next for them, who's behind that door, uh, you know, et cetera. And, and playing with your scene structure in that way, um, you know, even if we know that the reader is going to uh, not pause their reading experience at this point and come back tomorrow, uh, they're going to continue reading right through because we're only at page four right now. Even so, having that little scene break, um, that little pause, but also that invitation to keep reading, uh, it just means that the scene feels more structured and uh, we're keeping up that pace and keeping them on the hook um, as, as we draw them deeper and deeper into the story. Desperate, I cast about for some place to hide. Footsteps approaching, I darted about 15 feet from the Jeep, dove to the ground and rolled into the opening on a bottom shelf, pulling objects on the ground in front of me. That's when I saw, well, an alien. He came strolling right out, looking just like a creature straight off the cover of a Whitley Stryber book, maybe four feet tall, half of which was his head with the giant dark eyes and small mouth. Four others stumbled along behind. I mean, that's how it seemed that they were stumbling. Each was very different looking from the other. One was very tall, very slim. Another very hairy. The scariest was re uh, one was reptilian, like a walking lizard. I'm dreaming. That's it. I drank myself into a stupor and passed out. This is just a dream. I pinched my eyes shut and concentrated hard. My eighth grade algebra teacher, Mrs. Russo. Hmm, yeah, detention. I've been very naughty. I opened my eyes a slit. Dang it, still stuck in this stupid alien dream. They had removed Kevin and John's t-shirts and now the tall alien was trying to stuff big Kevin into skinny John's shirt. The aliens were very animated, talking excitedly. It sounded like a noisy jumble of clicks, whistles and grunts to me. But whatever they were saying must have been hilarious. I swear, it really seemed like they were... 
It really seemed like they were laughing. When one of them stuffed Evan's shoe into Kevin's mouth, they fell about the place. Yep, they were definitely laughing. This sparked a new burst of clicks and grunts, and right in the middle of it, I suddenly began to understand. Totally epic, bro. Oh, my God, Tinder, you're a genius. That dude's going to be like, where's my shoe? And then he's going to be all, why are you eating my shoe, bro? <laughs> Uh, so obviously we have, uh, you know, lots of absurdist elements here, uh, lots of comedy. Um, and, you know, I think that this, that it's all working well. Um, at this point we, we move into their communication. So they laugh themselves to tears. Greetings, Earthling, I thought, in accordance to the viral peace accords of 134008. We have established this link to announce our presence in your system and to explain your rights. This link will terminate in exactly four and three eighths of your minutes. Before I go on, I just have a note here. Uh, they laugh themselves to tears. Greetings, Earthling, I thought. In accordance, I, I found that a little hard, This I thought, uh, to follow. Uh, I imagine that they are communicating with our character telepathically. But I think there's a difference between hearing someone else's voice inside your head versus, you know, having your own thought. Um, and and so I would rethink how that telepathic communication is kind of presented to the reader because this is a little uh, difficult to understand. Or at least it seems a touch contradictory. Um after which we will no longer interfere with the outside occurrences of your life in compliance with the separate entity statute section 128 part 29 of the equitable hosting laws. So you can see this is very um, much about the bureaucracy of the uh, universe and various species that inhabit it. Um, we see that in Hitchhiker's Galaxy, uh, Guide to the Galaxy. And, you know, I think that it's a, uh, a funny thought that they're all kind of <laughs> traveling between worlds and, and taking over host bodies, but being very polite and legally correct as they do so. Um, the heck? I thought that? Dude, I'm totally losing it. No, Earthling, you are not losing your mind, I answered myself haughtily. And no, you did not answer yourself. I simply continued speaking to you. Please accept my apology if you feel as though I am being haughty. It's just that I have an obligation to relate a certain amount of information to you and only a short amount of time to do so. Now, if I may continue. So here, I think, you know, um, they're communicating telepathically. I don't know that we need the added confusion of him thinking that he's thinking these thoughts himself. I would imagine in the context of speaking to an alien, if thoughts suddenly popped in, up inside your head uh, that were very specific and outside your own scope of knowledge, you would assume that it's an alien communicating with you. So I think it's that it's a little bit of distraction a distraction that we can you know possibly lose and just have the aliens begin to communicate with him um the other thing i would say is that as far as we know he's hiding under a shelf um and the aliens aren't aware that he's there which is why they were uh doing lots of silly things with his friends and their clothing so if they fun suddenly uh spotted him in some way i would just add some kind of description that explains why or how or that they knew he was there all along or, or something to kind of straighten out that little continuity issue. Uh, sure, I guess, I answered, more confused than ever. As I held this conversation with myself, Tindo and the other creatures continued cracking themselves up, falling all over the place as they put my friends back in the truck. Uh, were they drunk? Um, if the friends were out of the truck, I would just clarify that. Um, like the truck was sucked up into the ship via a beam of light and the friends were all stacked up against the wall in a row but still frozen the just the, the blocking there and the description and action could be a little clearer uh uh yes they are drunk i thought no came an exasperated reply you do not think that i spoke it directly to your mind so i like the i like the absurdist kind of tit for tat um, conversation of them getting caught up in minor things when there are much bigger things at play for all of the characters to worry about. Um, but I wouldn't do it at the point to, I wouldn't allow it to become, uh, or to, uh, to make the, the narrative convoluted or difficult to follow. Here, I think it's one of those things where it's uh, distracting from the story more than embellishing it. So I'd rethink that. 
Uh, you did not think that I spoke directly to your mind. My name is Baylar and I am a legal counsel for the viral colonists who are, as we speak, setting up a colony in your sinus. My job is to inform you of your right to, whoa, I thought, wait a minute, you're a virus, a talking germ? I'm being infected? See here, earthling returned to the indignant Baylor. There is no need for name calling. I resent the connotations of the word germ and your crass use of the word infected, but I will forgive your ignorance because I realize that you come from a relatively young species. Now, may I continue to explain your rights to you? Do I have a choice? Sure, we could discuss the weather if you prefer, only when we get done, you will not understand your rights and I will get fired for incompetence. I'll probably have to find a new career, something that would be very difficult at my age. I'm 43 years old and was hoping to retire in seven hours, so please don't do that to me. I was taken aback with this. I'm sorry, I didn't realize my confused apology trailed off pathetically. Please continue. (laughs) I think that's really cute. I think that the... I. I, I love the idea of, um, you know, being abducted by aliens and them infecting your body, uh, but still uh, empathizing with the, the person that's abducted you and uh, very politely listening to them finish their speech. I think that's great. I think that the, the writing could be tightened a little bit. There's quite a bit of padding there, um, but on the whole, the, the ideas are cute. Um Thank you. Now, as I was saying, you have the right to maintain separate entity status by refusing to host any species with a separate DNA code from your own. I am allowed by law to mention that you currently host 304 different species of organisms in your body and each, really? Yes, and each of these species can be categorized as playing one of three roles, mutualism, commensalism, or parasitism. It's important to know that mutualism is a relationship between two species that is mutually beneficial. Now, I'm just going to pause here because we're seven pages in, uh, we're well into this scene, Um, the characters have been abducted and from this point on, without reading every line, I can tell you that um, we go through and there is a lot of explanation here about how these aliens operate as, um, you know, symbiotic kind of organisms that live inside other organisms. Um, Here, Bela goes on to say that there is always a slight risk of of death um, in these uh, symbiotic relationships that he is uh, required by their statutes to explain. Uh, we go into the the neurosystem of the and the nervous system and why that is a risk. Um, we go on where they have this kind of banter uh, and they're talking about uh, you know what could potentially happen if there's an accident. Um, we continue on here, uh, so. The alien is trying to explain, uh, you know, the risks involved in this symbiotic relationship, um, but also the benefits. But our character keeps cutting him off before he can get to the benefits, which I believe plays an important role down the line in the plot. Um, And again, more of this banter, more of these arguments between them, um, you know, again, the the character saying that he's not interested in this relationship, um, but, you know, uh, that the ability to uh, reject the relationship um, re- requires a huge amount of legal uh, recourse uh, and uh, there's a lot of to and fro between the characters as they discuss the different uh, civil courthouses in this new universe. And, um, you know, he will be a, a given legal counsel if he desires, but the process takes, you know, uh, so long and, and no one, no uh, single case has ever been overturned. So it's not even worth kind of doing. Um, but, you know, as you can see, this is a huge now slab of dialogue that has been going on for maybe 2,000 words and goes on for an additional 1,000 words. Um, and what we have is a lot of to and fro, a lot of info dumping, um, and it's just slowing the pace of the story because we've had this 
big dramatic kind of opening action where our character is going out um, and, you know, cow tipping with these guys chased by a farm with a gun and is suddenly, um, you know, abducted by aliens. So you might say that part of the story is like we're driving a hundred miles an hour, breakneck pace, anything can happen. And then suddenly we hit a wall and that wall is a very long Q&A between the alien and the human uh, in terms of what the aliens do, where they come from, the specific legal, um, you know, uh, consequences of, of their, uh, you know, inhabiting host bodies, uh, the, the medical consequences, their, you know, uh, uh, length of existence in the cosmos as a species, etc., 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 and I think that um, you can get away with a lot of this, particularly in comedic writing, when every single paragraph is crafted as a kind of joke and a punchline, and so it's like you know, in, in every story, we have the burden of keeping the reader engaged and entertained. And there are ways that we can, there are lots of different ways that we can do it. And different scenes will do it in different ways. Some scene might be so emotionally driven that our hearts are twisting um, for this character as, you know, these things happen and we, we gauge their reaction and the, the consequence for them. Some scenes are action driven and we're on the edge of our seats to find out what happens next as uh, the world's exploding or the bomb is ticking down or whatever. And then we have stories that rely more on their style to keep the reader engaged. That could be a work of literary fiction or comedic fiction where not an awful lot might happen in a scene, but it's so funny and it's written in such a uh, delightfully engaging way that uh, we're kind of, you know, reading each paragraph because it's a joke and a punchline in its own right. And so I think what we have here is a scene that includes elements of all of those things, but doesn't completely fulfill any one of those things as much as it could. So we have lots of comedic elements here, but they're kind of lost in this huge bulk of, of writing um, that is slowing down the pace. We have a big plot premise in that he's just been um, abducted by aliens, but very little happening in terms of action. Uh, we're kind of just caught in a long Q&A as we, as we uh, convey to the reader all of the you know, context and background and consequence of, of what is going on. And there's not a huge amount of emotional stuff going on because other than our character kind of being slightly uh, bemused and, and outraged, we still don't have a big sense of who he is as an individual and what this means for him on a personal level. He's kind of a, you know, a, a spokesperson for the group who's, you know, posing reasonable questions to the alien, but we don't get a sense that, you know, um, he's a, a jock or a leader trying to prove himself or or hide the truth from them or or that he's a nerd or you know any of those kinds of examples that i gave before that would um allow us to get a better sense of how this is impacting him personally in a very unique way versus how it might impact any person who would find themselves in the same situation so across kind of action and plot, uh, style and, and then character development, we have little bits and pieces of this scene um, that, that support each of those kinds of um, forms of engagement for the reader. But at, my feeling is that they're getting lost in the sheer bulk of the amount of text and the conversation, the back and forth, you know, it's, it takes a lot of work to have a back and forth conversation or information exchange um, between two characters that we sustain over four or five pages. It's hard to keep that truly engaging. That's why we use action, why we use other story elements to keep the scenes feeling um, exciting and to keep the reader on the edge of their seat. So if we have a big slab of information or conversation. It's not to say that that's wrong or that can't be done, but you're certainly setting yourself up a pretty difficult task as a writer to make sure that a reader is really going to be hooked on every line. It means we have to craft every line so that it's so funny or so engaging, or we have to dig much deeper into the character development, or we have to add a few elements of, um, you know, action just to, to keep that pace up and to keep it from feeling like it's lagging. 
So I'm going to pause things there and um, come back to, you know, really my summary recommendations for this recording uh, and this assessment. Um, I think the first thing is to, to really think about the, the key kinds of um, focus, priority of an opening scene, as I said at the beginning of this recording, which is to make sure that the reader cares about your character. You know, how can we introduce them, their dreams, their hopes, their fears, uh, not as a huge kind of police report of this is what I want in my life and, and this is what I'm afraid of, you know, showing instead of telling but hinting at, you know, what makes this individual unique and why should we care about the individual uh, so that when the plot uh, turning points occur, like being abducted by an alien, we uh, are, are more invested in, in finding out what happens next. And we also understand on some level that uh, this has a personal consequence for the character uh, beyond just any person being abducted. A, a single mother of three kids that's struggling to support them, well, if she's abducted by an alien, we immediately know that, yeah, being abducted by an alien is scary, but wow, if you're responsible for three children uh, and you're not going to show up for them, you're not going to show up for work tomorrow, there's a, there's a much more weight and gravity to your situation. So, so think about how you can use your character development, use their personal situation to raise the stakes, add more weight, add more consequence uh, so that the reader truly is on the edge of their seat to find out what happens next. Uh, my other point is just that structure is key, especially with kind of absurdist comedy works that are very personality driven, that are naturally going to have a bit of a, a meandering exploration or uh, funny conversations between characters. And um, all of that is great, but we still want to build up to key turning points. We want to make sure that we're not overloading the reader um, with too much information. And, and that also brings me to uh, my final point, which is to keep in mind all of the narrative elements that you have to work with and how you can weave them together as a kind of tapestry. So you have dialogue, uh, you have description, action, interior monologue, the character's own thoughts as they take in what's happening around them, exposition, which is another word for really backstory or information that's outside of the scene that then adds, you know, an additional sense of context to what's happening in the scene. Um, so in the previous uh, scene that we just went through, you know, we have a huge amount of dialogue, but we have very little action. Uh, we have a little bit of description, uh, very little interior monologue and very little, almost none and no exposition. So I think that there's room there to work with all of those tools. Um, you know, it, we might learn that the, the alien has uh, is a, a amoeba or something that lives in your sinuses. Um, and then we might have a piece of exposition there that says, uh, you know, uh, our character is an orphan and his father died of a sinus infection or grandfather died of a sinus infection the, the summer earlier. Well, suddenly we have, you know, something from outside the scene that is adding more weight to, to what's happening in the present and helping us to understand what this means for the character, what he has to gain, what he has to lose and, and how serious this is. That's a really rough example, but, you know, we want to be allowing the, the action to unfold in the present, but continually deepening our understanding of the character, where this person has come from, why we should care for them. So uh, dialogue, description, action, interior monologue, exposition, they're all uh, wonderful tools to use in your scenes uh, so that we don't have a huge slab of, of dialogue which can become a little bit overwhelming uh, and really slow the pace of the work. So those are uh, the, the key recommendations I had after reading uh, this sample. Uh, I have articles on each of these topics, character, empathy and introductions, uh, narrative elements and, and keeping them in balance and how to use them effectively in different types of scenes uh, on my, my website and my blog. So be sure to check them out if you, if you want to do some further reading on those points. Um, but really, uh, the, the summary that I would make at this point is that we have a wonderful 
engaging uh, opening scene. We have a fantastic uh, premise of someone being abducted by aliens, uh, being tossed into this kind of absurdist world. Uh, and so I think that there's a wonderful amount of uh, fantastic raw content there. And really that's the role of the first draft is to just get all of the ideas on the page, kind of work out who your character is and what they want and what, what they're doing. Um, and now as we enter a developmental stage to really think about how we can take that content and shape it to be as engaging for a readership as possible. So hopefully some of those ideas prove helpful. Uh, if you're watching this and you have any comments that you'd like to add about the assessment, maybe points that I've made that you disagree with or points that you've seen um, in the in the narrative yourself that you would like to put forward. Uh, maybe you've tackled some of these issues uh, in your own writing and you have advice or experience to share. By all means, uh, comment below. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. And as I sign off now, I just want to thank uh, this writer once again uh, for sharing his work with us today, for opening himself up to that experience. Um, obviously a big fan of his work and I think that um, there's lots of great stuff to work with here. I'm excited to see how this story comes together. So uh, until next time, uh, I will sign off. Uh, but thank you for joining us today. And if you're interested in submitting your own opening scenes for the Run the Gauntlet program, uh, send me an email, contact me on Facebook, and I would love to hear from you. All right. Bye.